So, a funny thing happened back in January. Nintendo announced the release of new Pokemon Snap, and in doing so, they didn't just continue their proud tradition of soon-to-be-dated naming conventions, it also marks the increased presence photography has had in the world of video games. Which might seem strange, considering how ubiquitous photo modes have been in most recent releases. If you were to examine pretty much any AAA game released within the past generation, you might be aware of a simple option where all action stops within the game, allowing you to create the perfect screenshot to share. And while these types of features are great to see and should be implemented in more games, I want to instead explore photography that occurs diegetically within the worlds of these games, to explore how this artistic medium is applied to these different works, and in doing so, demonstrating the different functions the act of photography might serve for each of these games and the characters behind the cameras. Like all art, Every piece of photography is going to involve a degree of creativity and self-expression within its production, which is reflected in the creativity that is employed by any player that might pick up a virtual camera. Though, depending on the mechanics that are being set by the game, the level of self-expression can become hindered. As a key example, photography in games like Fatal Frame is very focused on accuracy as a mark of success. With Fatal Frame, you can do more damage to the ghost if you center it within the shots, with the camera being treated more like a gun mechanically, where any elements of composition and self-expression is secondary to achieving basic clarity of the subject. And despite being considered the most famous photography video game, this complaint has also been leveled to the original Pokemon Snap. While it's true that Snap gives players a lot of fun problems to solve in order to photograph all the island's Pokémon, when it comes to the actual mechanics of taking a photo, any sense of creativity and composition are undermined by Professor Oak's grading system, where you could make a very well-composed photo worthy of those blockbuster printing booths that would still receive very few points if that Pokémon isn't in the center frame or facing the camera. And don't get me wrong, there is much fun to be had trying to get the highest score within this game, not to mention that it would be very hard to program a fair scoring system within the hardware limitations of the N64 without including such restrictions, though it's hard to deny that games where you have to accurately take photos on a set path or a single location can become creatively constraining after some time. But this does raise the question, however. What are some ways that developers have improved upon the basic principles popularized by games like Pokemon Snap? Alba by Utswa Games is a game where you play as a young girl visiting her parents on a small Mediterranean island, only to find that her favorite photography spots have been suffering from litter, pollution, and corporate exploitation. While the main story focuses on Alba completing different environmental tasks in order to stop the invasive construction of an island resort, the primary mechanics of the game focus on exploring the island in order to photograph and catalog all of the wildlife that can be found there. Unlike Pokemon Snap, there aren't any points assigned to the photographs you take. Instead, the game focuses on being able to catalog the different birds and animals on the island, though in order to do it, players will need to complete different environmental tasks in order to properly fill their island catalog. Whether it is picking up litter, journeying to previously unexplored areas, or simply listening to the distinct sounds that each animal makes, the lax pace and the degree of freedom that the game offers you makes the process of photographing the wildlife feel a lot more approachable than it might feel in Pokemon Snap. That said, this focus on approachability does come at the cost of complexity within the photography. As long as you can get the subject within the basic focus of the camera, the game will happily add it to your catalog, which resulted in me definitely fudging some of my pictures. Though for the younger audience that this game is clearly targeted towards, 
Alba is definitely a much more open experience when it comes to its approach to photography. Though, what might happen if there was more focus on the actual preparation that is often required for photographers? Nuts, published by Noodle Cake, has you playing as a rookie field researcher within the fictional Melmoth Forest. You are tasked with photographing the local squirrel population within the area, though unlike other photography games, your squirrely subjects will not make themselves known to you as easily. So much of the game is about placing three cameras within your section of the park during the day, so that come nightfall, you can watch through the recorded footage to scan a perfect photo. Something that I especially appreciate about this game is how it accurately portrays the reality of being this kind of researcher. Oftentimes, real-life nature photography is equally centered on navigating the environment as it is interacting with its wildlife. When I first played the game, I was initially confused as to why I wasn't able to find any squirrels out in the woods. I could hear them chattering around me, but I couldn't catch sight of them. It wasn't until the game asked me to head back to my camper and wait until nightfall to overlook the footage that I remembered, oh yeah, these are wild animals that have their own behaviors and aren't beholden to me. From there, I took a more passive playing style with this game, taking the perspective of these animals in mind when filming them. Oftentimes, I found the most success when I would position my cameras in a way that would not impede on the natural routes that these squirrels might make during the days. And the result is something that doesn't beget instant gratification, but a methodical process that increasingly becomes rewarding as days pass by while you accurately track these sort of unpredictable animals through the wilderness. And can I say, what a wilderness this is? I mean, look at it! Not only do these acid-soaked monotone palettes provide an easy-to-navigate environment, but it also creates this uneasy contrast of mellow hiking and uneasy dread that pervades throughout the Melmouth Forest. And while this might become repetitive as time goes on, the mystery that it sets up provides a compelling throughline for anyone exploring these woods. Though if there is a single title that has drastically represented the mechanical and artistic principles of photography, few have achieved it, like Umurangi Generation. During its 10 months of development, lead designer Neftali Veselikov Faulkner specifically prioritized the freedom of the players in deciding how to create their photographs. Not only do the players get to freely traverse the stages when they take their photographs, but they also have a growing level of choice in the lenses that they shoot with, the angle and depth of field within their shots, and the coloration of these photographs. While this might seem like a logical extension of these previously discussed mechanics, this design philosophy of the game is inexorably tied with a real-world philosophy called respectful design. Originally coined by the Aboriginal educator and researcher Norman Sheehan, Respectful design seeks to move elements of society away from a Western, human-centric philosophy, and in doing so, call upon the knowledge and perspective of indigenous communities when making decisions about the environment and the ways that we design our society. According to a 2019 write-up of this framework, in order to reach a respectful design space in which indigenous knowledge is embedded, a shared dialogical space between community and designer is essential. Meaning that to address modern concerns of technology, climate change, and social unrest, the primary agency of such change should be community-based, rather than one predetermined by some larger designer. Not only can this principle be seen in the freedom of traversal that this game offers players, it is also seen in how it treats your photographs. To progress through the game and unlock more lenses and abilities, you will have to photograph a certain set of items within each stage, preferably within a 10-minute time limit. While this might feel similar to photograph-based scavenger hunts that other games might send you on, how you photograph these items is often left open to the players, for example, in a later stage of the game, 
you might be asked to find a picture of a kiwi, and players will set out throughout the stage. And as they look throughout, they might decide to either find a billboard depicting the fruit, or they might explore even more in order to find a hidden piece of graffiti depicting the bird. Either way, the game will accept whatever photo you take. So far with these different examples of photography games, there is a focus on the player being asked to capture a specific thing that the game wants, often requiring that that thing be captured in a specific manner. Though this game follows the principles of respectful design by placing the determinant of quality on the player, and by extension, the community surrounding the game. According to Faulkner, the players decide how they want to take photos, and what is a good photo, not the game or the designer. Not only does this game pay tribute to Faulkner's Maori heritage through its gameplay, it uses photography to communicate its story and the experiences of its author. Despite its vast cityscapes, pervasive technology, and otherworldly threats, Faulkner will be the first to tell you that this is not a cyberpunk game. Instead, he opts for the label sh Future, as he believes that so much of modern cyberpunk storytelling glorifies the aesthetics of the genre while ignoring the realities that inform those worlds. Faulkner even goes so far as to say, For the last 10 years, it's been very much cyberpunk as an 80s circle jerk. And that's good, but I think cyberpunk pen and paper RPG creator Mike Pondsmith was on the money there when he said, it's like a mirror you hold up to what you're currently going through now. Part of what makes Umurangi Generation such an evocative work for me is how the act of photography forces a player to observe the world, both the good and the bad. Where other games might muddle their real-world inspirations or obfuscate its ideas in an attempt to keep politics out of video games, Umurangi Generations makes players seek out the problems that face this world. Its corruption, its joy, its inequality, its resilience, its contempt for the current system, all to be preserved by your photographs. In doing so, it actively calls for the player to bring forth their perspective when capturing these images, and likewise will make players more able to empathize with the struggles that these characters face. A first-person shooter might employ the exact same control scheme as a game like this, but how often do you actually notice the details behind those you aim at? How often can you say that you got to know the world of these games, understand what it is like to be someone who lives their day-to-day -day lives outside of these play spaces? Despite their simplistic graphics and different approaches to the craft of photography, all of these games create worlds that have felt more alive and intimate to me than other more polished AAA experiences. Whether it be a casual way to learn more about your world, a methodical process of precision, or an open means of expressing yourself in the face of hardship, photography games offer us a way to view the world in a way that invites empathy and understanding. Each one of these games doesn't just demonstrate the possibilities of non-violent ways of playing, but it also demonstrates the power that everyday people get to wield through this art form. By going out into the world and cataloging what we might see with our pictures, we have the ability to preserve fragments of our world. Such fragments can do anything from exploit, assist, expose, praise, criticize, speak truths to power, or overpower the truth. How we go about preserving our world is up to us. But as the photographer Dorothea Langis says, The camera is an instrument that teaches people how to see without a camera. So keep those cameras rolling. Best wishes. After four years of doing this, I'm actually doing one of these end cards. So, special thanks to Sarah Zedig and Liam Edwards for providing the quotes in this video, as well as to all of my lovely patrons in the Squirtle Squad. If you would like to join the names up on the screen, consider chucking me a dollar at patreon.com slash henrykathman. Otherwise, you can follow me on Twitter at the links below, or 
give me a little comment. Tell me, are there any photography games I left out, or any other examples of photography in video games that you find interesting? I would genuinely love to know because I cannot get enough of these sort of games. I don't really know how to end these things, so thanks again! See you later.